staff of the California Institute for Mental Health in collaboration with the Alcohol and Drug Policy Institute and the Integrated Behavioral Health Project, we would like to welcome you to the fifth of a six-part webinar series titled Integrating Primary Care, Mental Health, and Substance Use Services. The goal of this webinar series is to provide information on critical policy, design, financing, and practice issues related to integrated care from the California and national perspective. These webinars cover best practices and emerging practices in the field with presentations from state and national advocates, researchers, and practitioners. These webinars are free and open to all and are held from noon till 1.30 on the dates indicated in our schedule, which is posted on the CIMH website. To view the schedule or to register for actually our last webinar, um, go to the CIMH online learning link on the website. Uh, that information is also at the end of this webinar. Please note that you must register online for each web webinar that you wish to attend. The webinars will be recorded and posted on the CIMH Integration Initiatives website webpage following each event. This information will be covered again at the end of this presentation. So to kick things off, just to let you know, my name is Gail Bataille. I'm an Emeritus County Behavioral Health Director and a consultant with CIMH and organizer of today's webinar. The focus of today's webinar is bridging differences in the cultures of primary care, mental health, and substance use services. I am honored to be doing this webinar with such an outstanding facilitator and group of panelists. I will make introductions. Mary Rainwater, LCSW, is the project director for the Integrated Behavioral Health Project. Launched in 2006, IBHP is a project of the Tide Center with funding by the California Endowment as a strategic initiative designed to accelerate the integration of behavioral health services into primary care settings in California. Mary formerly served as program officer to the California Endowment and has been assisting the endowment in developing and designing its mental health portfolio since 2001. She also served as the executive director of the LA Free Clinic for 11 years and worked for seven years as a psychiatric social worker for the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health in a variety of clinical and administrative positions. She has a Master's of Social Welfare from UCLA and a BA from Loyola Marymount University. And now for our San Mateo County Behavioral Health Services panelists. Linford Gale is the Director of Consumer and Family Affairs for San Mateo County's Behavioral Health and Recovery Services Division. Linford served as a member and vice chair and chair of the Oversight and Accountability Commission for the Mental Health Services Act, Prop 63. He is a consumer survivor with a history of mental health and substance use problems. Linford has long-term recovery from substance use and practices wellness and recovery as a part of everyday life. Dr. Cynthia Chatterjee is the psychiatrist serving adults treated by the primary care interface team and previously worked with the Pre-to-3 mental health specialty team. She trained at UCSF and Stanford and has a part-time private practice. Um, we had intended to have Stephen Kaplan, who is the director of alcohol and other drug services for San Mateo Behavioral Health but um, he has unfortunately been called away to, because of a um, sudden death of one of the staff members. And Dr. Celia Moreno, who is, the, is a psychiatrist and is the medical director for behavioral health and recovery services, will address um, evidence-based interventions um, between San Mateo Behavioral Health and Recovery Services and the San Mateo Medical Center. So thank you, Dr. Moreno, for stepping in, I'm sure quite proficiently, uh, on behalf of Steve Kaplan. And our final presenter, and this is not actually in the order of presentation, but is Cheryl Walker. 
Cheryl has an MFT and has served as the unit chief for the interface team for the last 10 years. She has worked with San Mateo County Behavioral Health for 18 years, eight of which has been as a unit chief also for specialty teams. So before we get started, um, I want to just to give you a brief overview of how today's webinar is structured. Mary Rainwater will give an introduction and overview of our topic of bridging cultures, and will then facilitate a structured dialogue with our panel from San Mateo County to explore challenges and strategies that they have used to bridge the cultures of primary care, mental health, and substance use with the goal of improving and addressing the overall health needs of people with mental health and substance use problems. We will end our webinar presentation, panel presentation, about 20 or 15 minutes before the end of the webinar session. And at that point, uh, we will turn to questions from the audience. We are only able to take written questions because of the size of the webinar audience. And in order to send in your written questions, you can do so at any point during the webinar. Simply type your question in the dialog box that you see on your screen and click Submit. I will be collecting the questions and will pose them to our facilitator and panelists at the end of the session. So on behalf of all of our sponsors, CIMH and IBHP and the Alcohol and Drug Policy Institute, thank you for joining us today and we will now begin our presentation on Bridging Cultures bridging differences in the cultures of primary care, mental health, and substance use. And with that, I will turn it over to Mary Rainwater. Okay, thank you, Gail. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. And I'm really happy to be here introducing this topic and moderating the panel today. It's a, a very important topic, so let's get started. Uh, as this first slide indicates, there are lots of reasons historically, financially, and politically why we've developed such a siloed healthcare system, but that's really not our focus today, although it's certainly a worthy topic for another webinar. But today we're really going to focus, as Gail mentioned, on the impact at a more micro level and really explore how the cultural differences in these three systems, what they really look like at the clinical level, and import, more importantly, probably share some strategies with you on what you can do to overcome them. So when we talk about culture today, as this slide indicates, we're really referring to the different work and productivity patterns, the different training experiences, and really the different philosophies and perceptions that individuals hold, and how those then impact the work environment, and more importantly, the ability to effectively integrate across mental health, primary care, and substance use settings and professions. So let's go to the next slide, please. So the next three slides come from a toolkit that we've developed within the Integrated Behavioral Health uh, Project, which um, we put together as part of a toolkit to help um, build collaborative relationships between the specialty mental health system primarily and primary care. I've modified these a little bit today so that they also address some of the challenges uh, in integrating substance use, but um, if you want to see the full chart, because this is not actually the full chart, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's really quite helpful, and you can find it on our website, which you'll see at the uh, end of the slides. I believe the link to our website's there. So in general, this chart delineates sort of the fundamental differences between the primary care approach to behavioral health and that of the specialty mental health and substance use approach. So as you can see from that very first box, the first point, primary care really takes a population-based approach, which essentially means they screen very broadly and try to treat at least minimally as many as um, they have resources uh, to treat. Whereas in specialty mental health and substance use, it's a much different approach where it's very targeted on the individual and there's typically some very specific requirements in order to be accepted for services. Similarly, um, there are often differences in the severity and the types of illnesses that are treated in the different settings. And the actual approach to treatment varies, um, including the duration for how long someone's condition might actually be cared for in the setting and actually the uh, actual length and intervention of the sessions themselves so that historically 
in the primary care side of behavioral health treatment, the, the actual sessions tend to be um, more similar to what a primary care visit would look like, whereas in the mental health or substance use system, they've evolved uh, in a different model. So those sessions are often um, longer, although not necessarily, but they also also tend to focus on psychosocial and rehab issues, which primary care typically does not. Next slide. Um, this slide also highlights uh, how some of these diff cultural differences play out in treatment. One of the major differences that um, people are probably familiar with is that the pace um, in primary care is very different than the pace in mental health. And sometimes the purpose of the visit is also quite different. Um, in primary care, the therapeutic relationship is not generally the primary focus, where that tends to be very central to the mental health and substance use uh, setting. Another key variance is that primary care tends to start at a point of addressing behavioral health aspects of a health condition. So frequently it will go beyond that, and many clinics now are evolving to really um, encompassing quite comprehensive mental health services within their primary care settings. But really the early origins of behavioral health in primary care were really set up to work on the behaviors associated with chronic health conditions like diabetes, or heart disease, which are so frequently co-occurring with mental health conditions like depression or anxiety. So that's a major cultural difference between the systems. Also, uh, as you see from this chart, the deployment of the staff is different typically between the various settings. So in, um, the, in primary care, a behavioral counselor is generally added to a healthcare team, and the intervention supports the medical process going on, where in, again, in substance use or mental health, that would not necessarily be the circumstance and, the tre and it's not typically a team uh, approach. Next slide. So on this slide we see that there are even some really fundamental differences as they relate to how the interventions are documented. So again, in primary care there's sort of one set of practices in, in um, setting up uh, and charting uh, an interaction with a client and they typically are very short notes, problem focused. Whereas in mental health or substance use, that's not necessarily the case. And then in substance use, we also have the added complication of pretty stringent confidentiality regulations that are often um, challenging and create barriers, or can create barriers to care, both real barriers and perceived barriers on the part of practitioners. Um, it's important, I think, to talk about stigma, of course. And Many um, people believe that primary care offers a much more normal or destigmatized um, environment for, by, for providing mental health and substance use services. And that's certainly true in all the surveying that our grantees within IBHP have um, conducted with their consumers, their clients. And um, it, you know, it makes sense because you really can't tell why someone's sitting in a primary care office unless they're sneezing or coughing or exhibiting some symptoms. So, it's often very, very normal for people. People feel very comfortable and very normal seeking out mental health and substance use services in that setting. However, it is really important to remember that even if the physical environment is welcoming and less stigmatizing, as this last box on this slide says, the attitudes and the beliefs of the practitioners and even really the front office staff and, and receptionists and others who work in, in settings can really be stigmatizing and off-putting. And oftentimes we hear from consumers that primary care physicians or, or uh, people working in primary care settings can sometimes be dismissive of their concerns. Um, and conversely, on the specialty side, the mental health and substance use side, sometimes it's very challenging for primary care to find professionals who are willing to sort of work in the, the non-traditional environment that primary care presents them. It's very different from the traditional mental health systems in which they've been trained. So, Again, that's another culture gap that exists. Next slide. So I want to move now um, into what we've learned about how to break down these barriers and bridge the culture gap. And we, we've learned a few things. These next few slides are really based on some best practices that we've um, developed through our work at IBHP and also um, I've compiled from experiences that other colleagues in the field have shared with us. And, you know, they don't necessarily um, land directly on culture, but I think what's really important in thinking about this topic today is that there's a, a sort of a, 
a, a fundamental group of core elements and approaches that really are essential in achieving integration internally within a project. And, and really, they are how you reduce some of these culture gaps and really move towards an integrated model. So first on this list, which we've already acknowledged is not the topic for today, but really, truly, for integration, to really take hold long term. It's got to occur at multiple systems levels, and there has to be an alignment of the financial incentives to really support integration ongoing. Also, it's really not just clinicians and direct service staff that need to buy into an integrated behavioral health model. Really, administration and management within a setting or across settings, if it's a, a, a multiple agency setting, have to believe in the model and support it and have a shared understanding of the value of an integrated behavioral health model. Next slide. Next slide. OK, thank you. Um, obviously, we have to have provider buy-in and engagement. Um, and that's really key to reducing culture gaps and sustaining integration. And this includes having a shared philosophy across all the various disciplines that are working in a program, being able, again, to be flexible and adapting to primary care, and vice versa, primary care being able to adapt to a behavioral health setting. And what we found in feedback from our own grantees within IBHP that it's really useful to provide tools, kind of hands-on how-to um, documents and, and um, forms that can really help practitioners understand how to collaborate across agencies or even within their own setting and really customize it because we know that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to integration. So it's really helpful to provide tools to people in the, at the clinical level. Next slide. So again, it seems obvious, but really, if you can't engage the consumer, you really aren't going to be very effective, particularly since sort of the major thrust of an integrated behavioral health project is to really give consumers the tools that they need to become and stay healthy. So engaging consumers in their own care is really key. We've had one organization share with us that they have found it really effective to engage consumers around the potential for adverse drug interactions. Because uh, unfortunately, many times, many times consumers on are on multiple medications, and they have found that as a really good way of engaging uh, consumers in their own care. But it really should go beyond that and engage them in developing relationships with their provider team, and also ideally in sort of designing the way the program operates. Um, the team-based approach can really be a huge bridge to reducing culture gap because it's very design is built on you know, extrapolating the strengths and the skill sets of all the varied backgrounds of the people working in the setting. And so it can really go a long way to reducing the, the culture gap and to improving the efficiency of the team um, as well. Next slide. And the sharing of information, this is a really important point. I think when we convene our grantees, which we do regularly, this is probably the, the topic they talk about most frequently with us, and um, there's, it, it's really important to communicate and share information. It's one of the major strategies they use to break down the barriers between the primary care practitioners and the behaviorists within a primary care setting in particular. And it doesn't always have to be really formal or structured, although, of course, that's also highly coveted and, and desirable, and they work hard to get formal. Um, meeting times, but often it, it's a curbside consultation in the hallway or a conversation by the water cooler. But it's really about keeping the team and the consumer informed uh, and on the same page when it comes to treatment goals and outcomes. Um, also, we know from uh, our grantees that they really appreciate ongoing training and sharing of resources and materials. And again, it's not just at the provider level that that's needed. They often uh, express that it's really useful for the entire organization to receive ongoing training and support. And then, of course, information technology is key. And um, really using technology to its full benefit, particularly the use of registries and things that can help us track the outcomes and clinical outcomes of the behavioral health interventions. Next slide. And finally, I uh, just want to mention that as mental illness and substance use are increasingly thought of as chronic illness, it really has the potential to continue to destigmatize the illnesses and move them sort of away from these beliefs that some people sometimes have that there's it's the, the you know flaw of the individual or something um, at the individual level. It really opens up the opportunity to share approaches 
in working with mental health and substance use just like we would with any other kind of chronic illness and that there's going to be acute phases but hopefully also very long periods of uh, wellness and good health and client self-management um, towards that end. And um, finally, the, the movement towards a person-centered person health care model, which is certainly the thrust of a lot of health care reform right now, should also help reduce the treatment approach gap that has existed across the uh, systems because you know, it's really quite similar to the underlying principles of a recovery model in that really uh, the person, not the illness, is the center of the engagement and the interaction. So that should go a long way, hopefully, to reducing also some of the culture gaps. So let me stop there as sort of the general overview um, of the field and, and the issues. And let's move now to the next slide. And now we're going to go, as Gail said, into hearing both from the San Mateo Behavioral Health Services. Um, but first, I believe we're going to hear, next slide, from uh, Linford Gail. We're very fortunate to have Linford with us. And I'm going to just read for you the three questions that we would like him to address for us today in his presentation. So Linford, as a consumer with both medical and mental health issues, we want to hear what has your experience been like navigating primary care and having to deal with the different cultures between mental health, primary care, and substance use services. And then secondly, uh, you're also a consumer leader in California. So as such, you speak from your own direct experience, but you're also aware of the perspectives of many others. Um, and we'd like to know what has helped or hindered people with mental health and substance use problems in getting access to care and treatment in primary care settings. And then lastly, if you could just touch on why you think it's important to bridge cultural differences as we work to integrate care. So Linford? Linford? OK, I'm San Mateo needs to take their phone off of mute. Sorry, folks, we have an unexpected pause here. So we will, we will hopefully figure out what's happening with the San Mateo panelists. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> the challenges of technology. That's why curbside consultations are important. <laughs> so Mary, this is Gail. What, what would you offer as a curbside consultation at this moment? <laughs> um, well, we can <laughs> get them on the phone. Um, well, I don't know. Perhaps is is it possible to move to another speaker? Um, San Mateo, you may be on mute, San Mateo. If you could unmute your line, or perhaps Linford, you could get to another phone. Okay, I see Celia Moreno um, as on here, but they're not speaking. Um, so let's see what's happening here. I apologize for the difficulty. Yes, we, here we go. I think, do we have San Mateo on the phone now? OK. Um, I think if there's any general questions about the overview, if, if right, you know, right. we're we kind can of certainly general difficulties. I'm happy to take questions now, if there are any. People have questions about either our own project or sort of the overarching themes that I just threw out there. Well, one of the things that, that would be helpful, uh, Mary, I think, is, you, you know, you've talked about um, integration as one of the, the key ways to really bridge the work cultures mm -hmm. um, between primary care, mental health, and substance use. And I'm wondering if, if you can say anything about the experience that you've had um, with your IBHP participants, um, grantees, um, around how that impacts impacts health disparities, because that's certainly you know one of I mean people with psychiatric and substance use problems have huge health disparities, but when you add um, coming from a diverse cultural or language background to having any kind of, of mental health or a substance use problem, 
that creates a whole other level of challenges in access. Correct. And I think that's a really important issue, and it's actually sort of at the core and at the beginnings of why so many primary care community health centers in California in particular got into the business of behavioral health, because oftentimes they are the um, most culturally uh, relevant, they, ha they speak m many languages in their, they have a multiple language capacity within their organizations, and they're a very comfortable and trusted place for the community to go and seek out services. And frequently, not surprisingly, which we know from data, a lot of primary care origins are not necessarily primary health conditions, but things that have um, some sort of psychiatric or um, related um, condition. And so primary care centers began holding, the, finding themselves having to design programmatic interventions that work for that population. So I think it's deliberate that the, the point of entry for the population has historically not focused on the mental health or substance use condition, but actually focused on the health condition, which is, again, you know, often co-occurring with the mental health or substance use issue, because it's much more comfortable and culturally acceptable to talk about a health care issue than it might be to talk about a mental health or substance use condition. Also, the style of intervention tends to also be really um, supportive of the lifestyle and socioeconomic challenges that frequently those populations experience in the communities in which community health centers are located. So they're tried, they're, that we, there's a lot of use of the warm handoff model, which I'm sure San Mateo will talk about, where it's piggybacked right on the same day, same visit as the, the day they're seeing the primary care practitioner. And then the interventions are structured to be frequent, and, but, but short in duration, which is typically easier for that population. There's after clinic hour access. All those kinds of things are really important in designing uh, programmatic uh, approaches that are sensitive to the various linguistic and cultural needs. And they often use uh, approaches in San Diego. We have a group uh, of clinics that are organized through the San Diego Clinic Consortium that are really heavily vested in using a promotoris model, which is really using, you know, consumers um, from within the community to go out and engage with other consumers who need assistance in getting into clinics. So there's a number of approaches that clinics, I think, have uniquely customized that have worked for their populations, again, starting on the healthcare side, but then now moving into the mental health and substance use model. Okay, um, we are still struggling with um, with the San Mateo folks who we we checked all of our systems beforehand and they are for some reason they are still muted. Um, so we're working on those Gail? technical. Yes, this is Darcy. I'm just going to mute all and then I'm going to unmute us and see if that helps. But currently we're showing that San Mateo is on and unmuted. So hang on, folks. We're going to just try this. It'll take a few moments. Okay, Mary, Gail, and Celia, we should be all unmuted now. So do yes, we I'm here. This is Mary. And I'm Hi, here. Mary. This is Gail. Do we have San Mateo? San Mateo, if you could try to double check your uh, equipment. I understand you tried to dial in as well. Um, if you're able to actually switch over to use telephone and dial in by phone, that would that would probably work. So if you guys are able to try that, because currently we show you as microphone and speaker. So if you switch the toggle under audio to telephone, it'll give you a dial-in number and access code, and you should be able to dial in that way. <clears throat> okay, well, Mary, you and I are going to continue for a couple of minutes here. Um, <laughs> so, you know, one of the, one of the, the, I know the strategies that IBHP has used is really bringing together um, some of the, the your, your grantees to mm. think about how to create, you know, warm handoffs within their settings, and I would imagine that sometimes they've even talked about that, um, you know, with with their local service providers. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, I I see a note from San Mateo that they are on. San Mateo, can you speak, and we'll know see if we can go forward. Let's see if we hear. Gail, um, 
Dale, this is Dorothy. They're on the phone, but I think they are on by phone, but we're showing them as mic and speakers. So okay. I'm asking San Mateo if they're able to see under audio, if they can switch to telephone, and that may do the trick. Okay. They may have to dial back in, but currently I show them as mic and speakers, so that might be the discrepancy. Okay. So, um, Mary, while, while we're waiting to, again, try to get the San Mateo problems resolved, um, my question really is, what, what strategies have you seen among your grantees um, as, they, as they really try to, to create warm handoffs, either within their clinic setting or as they try to link to um, substance use or mental health specialty cares for their, their clients? Is that something that, that you've had any experience with with your grantees? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that one of the things we've, we've heard a lot from them, because a lot of what we do is try to foster through our learning communities an environment where they can kind of share best practices and strategies amongst themselves. And this question of how do you um, get the practitioners to, first of all, know that you have behavioral health staff available to help them is, is a big issue that a lot of them start, um, start uh, working on from the inception of the project. So a lot of them have developed really um, uh, creative techniques to market themselves to the primary care physician because you have to remember the culture is so different in primary care that primary care practitioners aren't necessarily even knowing what to do with the behaviorists, even if they are right down the hall from them. So a warm handoff is great, but only if a primary care doctor knows that it's available and what you use it for. So many of them, first of all, have tried to recruit a primary care physician, typically it's the medical director, who can really be a champion of the model. As I mentioned in my overview points, you really need to have um, provider buy-in. So they really need sort of a champion of the model, and, and typically it's, it's ideal if it's the medical director, but at least a couple of the primary care practitioners to really get that this is really helpful to them, and most importantly, helpful to their patients. So they develop a, a physician champion. Many of them have actually developed their internal marketing tools, flyers, newsletters, Starbucks cards, you know, uh, treats, whatever they can to really wait, raise the awareness of the primary care practitioners that they are available for warm handoffs. They flag the charts, they use pop-ups in the system, anything they can to help the physicians become sort of re-acculturated, re if you will, to understanding that this is a, a service that's a, available to them and useful to them and, their, and, their, um, con and the patients that are there to see them. So a large part of it is really changing sort of the way in which the primary care practitioners are oriented to doing their work. So they often exchange strategies around that. And obviously it has to be as easy as possible because the nature of primary care and the pace is that, you know, there's a, a lot, a lot of clients on any given day for them to, to get to see. The other thing that um, I think we've learned from them is that Many of them have found it really helpful to have access to a, primary, to a psychiatric consultant, whether it's through the local mental health department or contracted hours with a psychiatrist. You know, oftentimes primary care physicians are willing to prescribe medication, but they're reluctant to do so without the uh, ability to, to consult with a uh, psychiatrists. They may or may not have had received recent training on some of the use of medications. So that's a really important um, tool that I think the primary care community um, appreciates. And, and as I say, some clinics have actually moved to models where they're employing even on a part-time basis psychiatrists. Um, and and that's of actually, Mary, that's actually one of the, for folks that have um, not dialed into all of these webinars, uh, one of our earlier webinars actually focused on um, the impact model and related models. Um, last week it was on life. I think it's called lifelong right, care, yeah, yeah. Um, where they have they have done a variation of of impact or really done their own model to um, provide those embedded consultative services. Let me just switch to um, a question that's come in, and thank you for for the audience for hanging in here with us. We're still working on the technical issues. Yes, Luckily, we do have Mary Rainwater, who has a great Can you hear us? Yes. San Mateo oh, oh, is oh. on. 
<laughs> okay, I don't know what happened. What did you do? I didn't do anything. They just don't get <laughs> Okay, <laughs> folks. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Well, welcome, welcome to the webinar, San Mateo. Um, so Mary and I have been doing a little bit of a tap dance with the forbearance of the audience, and I think we're ready to move on to um, Linford Gale. To Linford. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Hi, this is Linford Gill. I'm the director of the Office of Consumer and Family Affairs for um, San Mateo County. And as a consumer, I, I thought um, the perspective I could give, since I have diabetes, actually it's, it's pretty chronic right now. I'm actually shooting insulin now. And I have a history of um, substance use and also uh, a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So getting services for all three have not always been easy in a one-stop shop and actually it's been pretty hard to, to coordinate services for all three and I I think I'm pretty active in, 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 in advocacy so I can imagine someone who's not that active in advocacy trying to go through all three issues and, and get them addressed. Um, actually um, as the bullet, as the as the next bullet reads, I received treatment for these conditions in mental health and in primary care settings around um, my AOD issues as well in a different setting. However, um, what I wanted to point out with that is that um, in the beginning, I did not get my primary care and mental health at the same place. They were two separate places. And I've, I've been um, having diabetes around the same time that I had started um, treatment for my mental health. And I was, they were not communicating with each other. So I think one of the problems is some of the meds that I was on earlier were, I had a lot of weight gain effect to it. And um, my, I guess I was predisposed to diabetes since my mother and father had it as well. And it really came on me all of a sudden and pretty dramatically as well. So I, I got um, really ill with the diabetes. But even at that time, I didn't know to tell the primary care doctor anything about the mental health doctor and the meds I was on, and nor was I asked about it either. So um, this was in the early 90s, and the stigma around mental health, it wasn't something I wanted to talk to my primary care doctor about anyway. So um, when they were treating me for the diabetes, that's basically what I let them treat me for. And I went to the psychiatrist when I wanted to talk about the mental health stuff and the meds for the mental health. So I learned the hard way, I think, that, you know, those two services should have been incorporated. But at that time, I, I, I really didn't know. So um, next one. the next slide is the primary care. Um, yeah, I think that we, we're talking about the culture of the, of the primary care, mental health, and AOD communities working, and they all three have different cultures. But it's also a, a subtext that there's also a culture of color or, or people of color who actually feel more comfortable going to primary care for all three as opposed to going to three different places because the stigma of mental health and the AOD world, it's, in my experience, it's better for me to admit to having a, a, a substance use issue than copying that I also have, you know, a mental health issue as well. It was really, really hard to do. And it was nice to say, oh, I'm in recovery. I'm in recovery from um, substance use. But I didn't know how to explain that I'm also um, working on wellness with um, mental health um, issues as well. So I never mentioned it. But at the same time, I think that's not unusual for people who have or, or minor minorities to show up at the primary care with um, mental health issues, but describing them as having um, some type of physical illness and probably having to be referred to um, a uh, psychiatrist or a therapist to address some of the other issues um, that the primary care doctor may have seen. So I don't think that's unusual at all. Um, one of the concerns I have about the three 
um, being put together is that when you go to a primary care doctor and you tell them you have a history of substance abuse and then you're experiencing pain, the first thing I, I personally experience from my primary care doctor is that, well, we're not going to give you any pain meds that has any narcotics in them. They're going to give you um, Motrin or aspirin or, or Tylenol. And I had, actually, I was in pain. I had knee surgery, and I was like, you know, you give me what you give other people because, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to abuse this. You see that I've had. But it was me advocating and demanding that I be treated as you would treat a patient that did not have a substance abuse history. And, you know, to have to have gone through that made me feel bad about disclosing and actually telling the doctor um, all of my issues because it kind of looked like it was um, used against me at a time when I actually needed to be um, medicated for pain. So he um, broke down and, and, and subscribed for me what I should probably have had for the pain. But like I said, I, 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 I'm an advocate, so I, I can advocate if I, you know, advocate for others. I certainly know how to advocate for myself. But there's a lot of clients and, and, and consumers who would have just walked away and um, felt that, you know, they weren't supposed to have anything to really knock the edge off or take the pain away. So, again, I think there is some discrimination when you disclose to your primary care doctor that you have a mental health or a AOD history, that they feel that if you get the wrong drugs, you'll be back on a mission again and back to using and abusing drugs. So they're trying to look out for your best interest. But also, there's a flip side to that where it's actually making you feel um, stigmatized. So I think there's a way of doing it without making the client or an individual feel stigmatized. Um, you know, the the... The stigma reduction can be really powerful if we were able to um, do an effective integration of the services in a one-stop shop. I used an example once when I was in San Francisco and I was on the Ryan White AIDS Commission, and they were sending all this money to the Castro, to this really well-developed um, gay organized community. And they were going to pull the money out of Bayview's Hunters Point, which is the African-American community, because nobody was going to the center to get help because it had AIDS on the front of the building. It was like a plague. So the same thing that we look at how to bring services to, in, to different cultures, we have to incorporate the three cultures of the AOD, primary care, and mental health world, so that we can respect each other's culture. and treat the individual the way they should be treated as a whole person. So now I can get my services treated all together. But, you know, AOD has not really been an issue of mine for the past 19 years. I've been sober and off of um, methamphetamines and all these other drugs for 19 years now. But I'm looking at the people who are still struggling with their addiction and trying to get services, it's going to be really hard to get services when the doctor is looking at you and saying, well, you know, you're self-medicating, I can't give you any medications. It's still very difficult, but I think we have to try to do a non-discriminatory kind of a um, health care setting so people can feel comfortable and not feel less than. Um, so... Is there one more slide? I think you have one more slide that has some important points that we want you to hit. All right. Here it is. There it is. Primary care is less restrictive for people trying to access treatment and services. When I say that, my experience has been, particularly working in mental health the way I've been doing, when you go to primary care setting and you have your partner with you or somebody, the doctor used to come out and talk to the, the family member or talk to the person that brought you to the hospital to help them pull you together and help take care of you. When you go into mental health, 
unless you sign some type of release. You really don't have any support on how to take care of your mental health and how what you really need to become um, to get the support you need. I think there's a lot of um, secrecy or a lot of um, restrictions as as far as an individual and their mental health as opposed to somebody with a chronic illness. And I think if we incorporated those ideologies where a family member came in around um, their loved one's mental health issues that, um, you know, it's kind of hard to sign a consent when you're in an episode. So it's, it's really important that we start looking at how to incorporate some of these um, um, practices in each, a little bit in each of the different cultures of the primary care and um, AOD. And um, I, I wrote this as a personal hindrance of mine, is even though I have private insurance and I needed therapy and it was quite clear that I needed a, a psychiatrist, I want, I had a hard time um, finding an African-American um, therapist. And my insurance at the time I was working um, declined going out of the their um, yeah. network because they felt like it wasn't important. I I didn't have a language issue, um, so it wasn't important that I had to um, or wanted to work with somebody who looked like me. And I again went into advocacy mode for myself, and I had a hearing and had to go through all of this. Um, jury stuff to sit down and finally, you know, I got the, um, the, the, the services I needed. But the point is that most people probably would have just went away and not have done it. So to wrap it up, I think it's really important that um, we have people that really believe in this um, collaboration and believe that um, individuals de deserve to be treated as a whole person and not in little segments and have to go all around town to find um, services for the one individual. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Linford. That is really, um, it's always so much more real when we <laughs> hear the perspective of the consumer. I'm going to, and hopefully we'll have time to take some questions for you later. I'm going to turn now to Sam Mateo, and I know we'll probably have to pick up our pace a little bit because Gail and I had to do our little uh, song and dance earlier, but um, San Mateo, we're really pleased to have you today. They have over 12 years experiencing experiencing an integrated model and all the challenges and opportunities that go with that, which you can read here, so I won't read them for you. And we're really fortunate to have Cheryl Walker with us today. She's the unit chief for San Mateo's primary care interface team. So Cheryl, how has your organization worked to integrate care? Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. You know, Limper has given us a personal and a consumer's perspective, and I'm going to try to give you an overview of what we've done. Uh, we're embedded in primary care, and what we do is we use every tool available to us as employees of behavioral health to facilitate the communication that can happen between primary care and then the specialty mental health clinics. What I like to do is I like to think of integration points as the places where the interface team members touch other organizations, and I don't just mean primary care. Um, those points where we touch um, are where teams and departments and communities uh, come together, and they really are places that are opportunities for us to expand our interactions with each other and with all of the different work cultures because we really are all working together to serve our consumers. Um, finding and uh, using the points of integration, I think, has also been helpful in moving the interface team closer to seamless integrated care and helped us reduce the health disparities. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, interface team is embedded in seven primary care clinics throughout San Mateo County. We have five bilingual, bicultural, Spanish-speaking uh, uh, mental health therapists, we have one bilingual Chinese therapist, and we have two part-time bicultural psychiatrists, and one of our psychiatrists who is here today also speaks Spanish. Um, we also have two full-time uh, bicultural therapists, one is African American and one is Spanish speaking, and they work in the Human Service Agency providing mental health services to that agency, and uh, as you can see that gives us another integration point. 
Uh, next slide, please. Additional behavioral uh, health points uh, in our systems are we have two nurse practitioners uh, that work for primary care, but they are embedded in our three specialty behavioral health clinics, and they provide primary care services to uh, seriously mentally ill consumers in those clinics. Um, there's also a behavioral health resource team, and that team is able to provide case management to assist the homeless mentally ill consumer to obtain uh, housing and appointments in primary care. And uh, the, really, the reason that is so important is there, there is a large waiting list uh, in primary care, and they are able to take those clients right to the head of the list and get them appointments. Uh, next slide, please. When the, when the uh, team was formed in 1994, uh, we knew there were about 40,000 patients there at that time, and there was only just a couple of us in, in those clinics. So we wanted to make the um, we wanted to make it as easy as possible for the providers to make a referral. And when you look at these cri the criteria here, which is very simple, there really uh, there isn't a barrier to making a referral there. Um, I think the biggest fear at the time is we would get 10,000 referrals, but we didn't. Uh, um, we actually, um, the doctors were uh, actually at first rather reluctant to make referrals um, because they didn't want to refer somebody that they thought maybe wasn't ill enough. So it took some time for them, uh, about a year, to really step up and, and make a, a fluid referral. Uh, next slide, please. Um, over time, we developed a menu of interventions in direct response to the consumer's needs and the expectation of our providers. Most of our providers, we found, are very experienced and provide basic mental health treatment for adults and children. What they really wanted help with after the first couple of years was help for their patients that have complex symptoms and functional impairments and or substance abuse that, for whatever reason, have not made it into the larger specialty mental health clinics. Next slide, please. Um, there's some obvious differences between primary care and behavioral health. The most obvious ones um, are the uh, volume, the pace, uh, uh, and the focus of the treatment. I, I think, uh, you know, I like to focus on strengths, and our strengths really between all the organizations we uh, come in contact with is really the passion for wellness and our desire to help. Uh, if you agree that working in silos is not effective, then talking about work cultures is a helpful place to start for managers and supervisors and staff. Uh, I really believe that once there's an understanding that work cultures exist, it's easier to build operations and procedures that are going to foster communication and collaboration. Uh, because we understand and value the work of the primary care culture, Primary care has learned to value the work and culture of the interface team and the larger mental health system. I have two very brief examples are when we need space, and space is very precious, uh, but if we need space and, and, and if any is available, they give it to us. Um, if we ask a provider for a talk screen, there's no question, they give it to us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide dealt a little bit with my, I, I tried to reconstruct my philosophy about, you know, what made me think about work cultures, because when I started this, I didn't think about work cultures. What, what would happen, I would find myself kind of butting heads with people and feeling irritated and, and confused and wondering why aren't things working more smoothly. But when I, I, I started to um, rethink that, possibly that this was, um, um, people with good strengths all trying to go to the same goal, uh, that maybe there was something that I really didn't understand. And so I just looked at the idea of cultures and uh, work cultures and decided that um, I needed to restructure my thinking a bit. Uh, next slide, please. I think working, uh, recognizing that work cultures exist gave me a structure to rethink my many assumptions and expectations about primary care and other organizations. And naturally, it's important to understand that all those organizations have their own preconceived notions about our structure. And it would be helpful to help them also rethink that. 
Today when I'm uh, interacting with primary care and I experience a barrier, or honestly if I'm feeling confused or irritated, um, I know the barrier is related to work culture. And, I, and when I'm talking with my team and they're having those feelings, I just use that term every day. And it has really helped our team interact better. And it's helped, uh, I think it's helped primary care also. Um, some bridge building tools. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, there we are. Some bridge building tools that we have. Um, uh, you know, all tools that you develop work. Some, some really just work better than others. Um, we have access, and we have always had access to all current and past primary care and mental health records, and that includes specialty mental health. So that includes all patients currently treated by um, all, both of the clinics. If you don't have, uh, if you don't have this kind of access, or you cannot find a way to gain this kind of access, what you may inadvertently do is build yourself a new silo, rather than really fostering an effective collaboration. Um, Ten years ago, when we first started, uh, we still had that access, but referrals to the interface team from primary care, they were verbal, they were telephone, voicemail, face-to-face, -face. someone bumped you in the hallway, and, and honest to God, we had sticky notes left on our door. Um, none of that really worked very well, so we sat down with primary care, and we developed uh, and decided to use a referral tool that primary care already had for the specialists. And that was uh, the intra-agency referral to, uh, uh, form, and it's a piece of paper. This still did not guarantee that our clinical information would end up in the patient's chart, so we sat down again. And uh, we decided we would dictate our findings into the primary care computer record. At that time, they had a paper record and a quasi-electronic record. Um, so they had both of these forms. The dictation, unfortunately, did not always wind up in the paper chart. Uh, the other problem was that our information was not in real time, so uh, it was always delayed by the dictation process, resistance of the therapist perhaps, who none of us really liked doing that kind of dictation. It's hard. Um, uh, but we did that for several years. Um, today, I'm very proud to say that primary care has an electronic record for all outpatient treatment. In March, the interface team started typing all of our findings into the patient's electronic primary care record using a code that prevents billing. Uh, this, we also developed uh, a new release form that says in very plain English that, that this is what we'll do if, uh, on our consent forms. Uh, this data is currently sent also to the providers by into their clinical email, so it goes into the client's record immediately and it sends an email to the doctor's clinical email. Uh, and, and the doctors were thrilled and said, gee, you guys really do work hard, don't you? Uh, in May, the interface team started using our own brand new behavioral health electronic record. And um, I'm looking for ways that um, perhaps primary care can find ways to adapt some of that for, the, for their use too. Um, Primary, uh, an, another tool we have is that primary care and behavioral health are also able to share prescription records for the health plan of San Mateo. And I think that's, I think that's all of my comments. I hope that's helpful. Those are really excellent. Um, Cheryl, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll have people want to follow up with you in the Q&A. So let's move now to Dr. Cynthia Chatterjee. You're a psychiatrist who's worked in both primary care and mental health settings. So can you discuss for us your role as a primary care interface team psychiatrist working in primary care clinics? And if you could share some of the vignettes that you um, developed for us and, and how you work with your clients, that would be very helpful. Sure, I'd be happy to. Hi. Um, so in the specialty um, mental health clinics that I've worked in before, um, and it's a traditional model, is that the, the care is usually long term. And uh, in our interface clinic, I usually do either a one-time consultation um, or uh, sometimes I'll provide brief treatment for a few weeks and then uh, refer the patient back to the primary care provider for ongoing treatment or if they have a serious mental illness, refer them to the specialty mental health clinic. Um, when I first see the patient, I do an in-depth assessment. Um, and I love this part. I'm able to uh, read all the electronic records that are online for um, all the primary care visits and, and other specialty visits and all the labs and everything. So I go through all those. 
um, I'm able to talk face to face or through email with the, the primary care provider and um, uh, and with the therapist and I'm able to read all the therapist notes and um, because I'm often able to do a I'm always able to do a more in-depth assessment than is allowed in primary care um, uh, I'm often um, diagnosing comorbidities. For example, a patient might be referred for depression, but it turns out they also have OCD or psychosis or substance abuse. Um, if it turns out that it is something simple, straightforward, a, a major depressive episode, for example, um, I'll do just a one-time consultation and say recommend an antidepressant, and then they'll continue to see the, the interface therapist for, for brief therapy. Um, if they're more complex, then I will take them on and stabilize them and um, see them for several weeks. And, and then once they're stable, refer them, if appropriate, back to primary care or refer them to the mental health clinic. And either way, um, as Cheryl was mentioning, um, I write notes for the primary care um, medical records. Um, and, and that's usually not done in the specialty mental health clinics. Um, also, in my role in, as the interface um, psychiatrist, I can provide training and um, support uh, to the primary care providers. Um, next slide, please. So the interface team screens about uh, 1,500 patients a year and treats uh, 1,000, and about 5% um, or, or, or less are transferred to a high le higher level of care. And the unit chief of, of interface, um, Cheryl Walker, uh, and uh, the unit chiefs of the specialty mental health clinics, either child or adult, um, handle that transition. Um, next slide, please. Um, for the vignettes, um, so this first uh, vignette is, I'm not going to go through the whole thing in detail because we're running short on time and you all have the handouts. but. Um, this is a, a one-time consultation example. So this was a simple case of a woman with a major depressive disorder. She had not been on any previous medic antidepressants other than what she was being um, prescribed at that time by the primary care provider, and it was a relatively low dose. And so I simply recommended increasing the dose and waiting um, some six weeks, and then um, if she didn't have any response, then to switch to a different category of antidepressant and also rec recommended um, checking her, her thyroid function tests. Um, next slide, please. Um, an, an example of uh, somebody was referred to the uh, specialty mental health clinic. This is somebody I'm actually still seeing. This is a young man um, referred for depression and anxiety. And when I assessed him, it turns out he actually was very manic with mixed symptoms. He had OCD. Um, he had PTSD. Actually, five of his friends had died to violence. And he was using um, marijuana every day. Um, and then the, the labs revealed that he actually had um, hyperthyroidism. He was diagnosed with Graves' disease. So I've been treating him with antipsychotics and mood stabilizers. He was seen by endocrinology, and they started him on medication for his Graves' disease. And I also referred him to the substance abuse counselor. And um, he's currently actually doing quite well. He has some residual symptoms, but he's going to class and getting A's. And, um, um, we're still trying to sort out how many of his symptoms are due to substance abuse versus Graves' disease versus an underlying um, mental illness, and that's going to take some time, and he's probably going to be referred to the regional pretty soon. Um, next slide, uh, to the um, specialty mental health clinic. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, that's it. Okay. So, um, and this is an example of somebody who was treated briefly and then returned to primary care. So this was a young woman referred for depression, anxiety, and irritability. And on assessment, it um, turns out she had a 17-year history of uh, serious substance abuse and was just recently clean and sober. And so I saw her for several weeks. Um, she was also uh, drinking a lot of caffeinated beverages, had very poor sleep hygiene, and so recommended decreasing caffeine and gave her some um, uh, sleep hygiene advice and um, started her on Campril, which is a medication for alcohol dependence. And she did really well, and after a few weeks went back to primary care for ongoing prescribing of the, the Campril, and she was in a, a substance abuse program. Um, so she's somebody who did very well. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then with training and support, um, uh, I sometimes do curbside consultations. So these are just a brief, you know, sort of 
consultations in the hallway uh, without actually seeing the patient, um, usually very general. For example, I have a patient who's obese and she needs to be treated for depression, and, and can you tell me which antidepressants does cause weight gain? So that's an example. Um, and then um, more complicated examples are um, a, a case presentation um, uh, to all the primary care providers in a particular clinic um, regarding a particular patient who had bipolar symptoms, borderline traits, um, opioid dependence for chronic pain, and alcohol abuse. And um, so we discussed all these uh, relevant issues, for example, the overlap of borderline and, and um, bipolar symptoms and the controversy of opioid prescriptions for people with chronic pain. And, um, uh, and uh, I presented some uh, journal articles that were relevant to these. And, and so that was one example. And then another example is a case conference of, a, again, another complicated patient where um, the patient um, was also on opioids for chronic pain. She was having hallucinations and a lot of cognitive impairment. She had been in several car accidents. And the, she was also on benzodiazepines. And the, the primary care doctor was um, getting pressure on all sides by different family members about how to treat this patient. So um, we in the interface clinic um, arranged for a case conference that included uh, primary care doctor, the patient, the patient's family, uh, her therapist, myself, and the substance abuse counselor. And in that meeting, it came out that the patient was actually uh, getting a lot of um, opioids and Valium on the streets, and, and that was impacting um, her mental status. And so we all came up with a unified treatment plan, um, and that was very supportive, I think, to, to primary care and to, and to the patient. And I think the next presenter is uh, Dr. Moreno is filling in for. Um, Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. That's uh, so helpful to hear the vignettes. As, as Gail mentioned, unfortunately, Steve Kaplan couldn't be with us today, but we're um, fortunate to have Dr. Celia Moreno with us. So, Dr. Moreno, if you could talk about the challenges, barriers to integrating substance use screening and intervention into primary care clinics, and then what are some of the approaches that you're using there in San Mateo to break down the silos that are barriers to integration? That would be great. Okay, thank you, and I'll try to be brief because I know time is uh, <laughs> of the essence. So um, we have been piloting in, in, uh, here at the medical center. Um, we, we did some trainings on the evidence-based practice of SPURT, and I know that you've had a webinar on that topic, um, but we had to somewhat adapt it to what was workable in our setting, our setting. and in October of '09. We, we began a pilot here at the medical center. So in addition to the screening of every primary care client, um, and then there's a brief interaction between the physician and the patient, uh, and then we're able to have different levels of referral. Um, there, here at the medical center, the interface team is called med psych team, and that mental health team can do a brief intervention of up to three sessions. Uh, around substance abuse, and then if the person needs more more services than that, or it's a more complex condition, they're referred to an AOD specialist for up to ten visits. So this may be uh, the beginning of preparing a consumer with substance abuse to be ready or be motivated toward change, and then can be referred to other AOD resources. And as with any program, you know, implementing a new model has its ups and downs. And uh, we have been meeting collaboratively between BHRS, San Mateo Medical Center staff, and AOD staff to coordinate this model and um, deal with the, the issues as they emerge. And um, as with the integration of mental health described by Cheryl and Dr. Chatterjee, I think that there are important uh, cultural differences that have to be, be looked at. Um, and I'll go very quickly through these. But I think that the issue of time and the fast pace of primary care and the multiple screenings and responsibilities that primary care providers have to contend with in a 10 to 15 minute visit it is quite a challenge. And so for example, in our BERT model, which we call PEER, patient intervention, education, and referral. The actual uh, uh, screening is not done by the PCP. The PCP gets the result of the screening and then has a 
brief interaction with the client. But this was just, again, the, the time pressure of the PCP. Also, um, individual um, doctors or primary care providers are going to differ, and I think Linford spoke about that, in terms of their own stigma or how they perceive clients um, with substance abuse. Uh, they may feel that people have done this to themselves. They may have lack of knowledge. They uh, may feel uncomfortable. And actually, according to the AMA, the American Medical Association, up to 50% of physicians may not feel competent intervening with a patient um, regarding alcohol or other substance abuse. And um, in another study, 40% had difficulty talking to a patient regarding any addiction issue, compared with only 20% uh, having difficulties dealing with depression. There's also, um, they may have a higher level of discomfort. And they may have also skepticism about what does work for substance abuse. So there's a big component of educating, and I think that's the plus of having our services integrated. As Dr. Chatterjee mentioned, we're really learning. There's really multiple opportunities to be exposed to the different cultures and to address the, you know, our clients, especially in the county system, are so complex. And, you know, I think it's more the exception that someone just has a medical problem or just a mental health problem. It's really this integration, and that's why integrated services work. Um, in terms of how we're feeling the challenges that we need to address, it's really to find efficient ways to implement these, screening, these screenings, minimizing time, um, to show primary care providers that our interventions do work, and that means you know, to collect data from our own efforts and to show a significant improvement in the, in the consumers. Uh, increase, as I mentioned, the comfort level of physicians and their level of knowledge around both substance abuse and mental health and continue, continue to address stigma. And then um, recapping, you know, some of the things, because this certainly is a work in progress, some of the things that we're looking at Again, like Cheryl mentioned, further integration or further work within this integrated model is one is the area of chronic pain, and that's another sphere that um, interfaces with mental health, primary care, and substance use. And we are having, frankly, an epidemic of chronic pain clients uh, with many demands, uh, many of them on opiates, the concern for uh, the potential toxicity of being on opiates and so forth. Uh, we also want to continue to work on the peer model and to expand it to um, all our primary care clinics and to work collaboratively with the interface team. Uh, we are also thinking about and planning this summer to embed a, an AOD specialist into the interface team so that we would have a really sophisticated, uh, a person with a lot of sophistication and knowledge uh, as part of our team. And then also uh, we are doing a CalMend project, which is actually, uh, again, another integrative effort of following, um, we mentioned the nurse practitioners that we have uh, nestled in our primary care clinics. And uh, we're going to follow clients that, that one of our nurse practitioners sees who have, um, who are on atypical antipsychotics and may have metabolic syndrome, uh, you know, the elevated lipids, uh, maybe diabetes or the uh, high sugars, uh, obesity, and we're going to try to improve their medical care through a uh, an advocate, a someone on our teams that is going to work with them to keep appointments to communicate with primary care in an effort to that way provide a better outcome. I think that's all I wanted to share at this point. Okay. Um, well, this is this is Gail Bataille coming back on, and I really want to thank the San Mateo panelists and. Just to remind folks that we have some questions which I will move on to. 
Um, and we have about 15 minutes before the end of the webinar. So again, if you want to send in a question, simply type it into the dialog box and click Submit, and I will receive it. Um, so we're sorry we can't do um, you know, verbally the questions, but the type questions will suffice, and we'll try to get back to you um, later with frequently asked questions. So at this point, let me start with the questions. And the first one um, is to the San Mateo panelists, um, how do you keep the records where the nurse practitioners are embedded in the behavioral health clinics? Do you have one chart that includes the physical and mental health information, but how do you get how do you get the information and the records from your nurse practitioners that are embedded in behavioral health? Maybe I can answer that. This is Dr. Moreno. Um, they keep their own primary care records. Um, however, those are now, as Cheryl mentioned, electronic, and uh, our, we do have access to them in mental health, but it is a separate record at this time. Thank you, Dr. Moreno. Um, you know, one of the other questions that came in, and, and we will not go into this in detail today, but it was, what are registries? And I think it's pertinent to the, the last question about how do you access records back and forth between the systems. But, um, you know, at a future webinar, we may speak to this, but a registry really is a, a system that's a bridging um, of the the critical uh, medical, mental health, and substance use information on clients or patients that are shared um, between the systems or even within an embedded system. And it allows the practitioners, the clinicians, to really look at developing um, integrated responses and knowing what each other are doing um, in relation to a particular client. And they also allow the, the system to look at trends and to perhaps lift out uh, groups of clients with similar symptoms um, or similar problems so that they can, can focus on focused um, interventions. So we will probably next in the fall, we will be looking at some additional webinars and we may focus on registries. That's one of the things we've been thinking about. Um, an, another question that has come up and, um, you know, I think the San Mateo folks really have kind of spoken to this, but is, has anyone used county mental health staff to provide these integrated services, or are all of the providers private nonprofit? And, um, you know, just to say in, in the case of San Mateo, they are county mental health staff, but I think is what is unique in San Mateo is that they literally have developed a bridging team that is embedded in primary care and embedded in some other uh, critical services. So I don't know, um, Celia or Cheryl, if you want to say anything further on that. Otherwise, we can move on to another question. I think we can move on to the other question. You know, these are county, uh, we are all county providers. There is an FQHC um, in our county, and we do try to um, build, a, we've got a linkage between them and a specialty mental health clinic, but I think we have, a, uh, there's other things that we could do, because I would like Interface to actually be connected to that clinic too. Okay, um, here's a good one, and, and Mary, you may want to jump in on this one too, but the question is, how do you get multi-agency buy-in on low-cost provision of treatment? Everyone has a budget to meet and everyone thinks their own program is the most important one. So how do you get you know, the three systems, really, to, um, to link together in terms of understanding that there's a, there's a common, I guess, gain? Anyone want to take that one? Well, this is Mary. I, I think that is um, a big challenge, um, certainly in the work that we do with the community health centers. Um, one of the things that the California Primary Care Association has tried, um, unfortunately unsuccessfully, for three legislative sessions in a row now, if I'm not mistaken, is to introduce a bill that would allow for same-day billing of mental health and 
um, a behavior, I mean, excuse me, a behavior health visit and a primary care visit, which right now, based on state Medicaid regulations, not federal, but state, we're not able to do. So primary care center can bill for dental care and primary care on the same day, but not mental health or behavior health and primary care. And the reason that's relevant is they've done a really good job, and we can certainly rank that available to people, of, of um, demonstrating you know, that there is cost savings to be had by treating mild to moderate mental health and substance use issues in the same day warm hand of primary care model. Um, but you know, unfortunately, as I say, it's not been successful so far. I mean, part of that really has to do, Gail, with sort of the rebundling of how we look at services and address them. And fortunately, I think under healthcare reform, there's some opportunity to look at how to um, change the payment structures. And I know under the waiver, there's some discussions going on around that in the coverage initiative counties to try to align financial incentives, including. Um, some kinds of bonus payments and incentivizing the systems to work together on that. But um, you know, the data definitely supports that there's a reduction in cost. The question is, how do we get the policymakers to adopt that? And you know, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet right now to do that. Right, and there actually is a related question that someone sent in, um, and which is, currently there is no financial incentive in place for primary care to see persons with serious mental illness, and they are not funded to do so, can you speak on the selling point to them for buying into such a system? Um, I think that really that question really ties to what Mary was just speaking to. Um, you know, again, with the in a very short time, um, there will be clearly more structured incentives as a result of healthcare reform. Um, but, but I would also just, um, and, and we'll be speaking about this more actually on June 24th, um, there really is also um, a financial incentive. It may not be a reimbursement incentive, but there can be a financial incentive for primary care practitioners um, or clinics to, um, to treat folks who have some of the more serious mental illnesses. And that, um, you know, there, there are experiments going on around California um, with counties, some of them with private um, clinics, FQHCs, and some of them with county clinics, um, where they're really trying to look at um, really what the shared incentive is for treating um, folks with at least moderate to stabilized serious uh, mental illness in the primary care setting. Um, and I think the San Mateo folks have addressed some of the, the reasons behind that in terms of uh, access to care, less stigma uh, associated with receiving care. Um, the other fairly clear underpinning to all of this is, and those of you that have been tuned in throughout the webinar series, you've heard this before, but is that we know that people with serious mental illness and substance use disorders have a much higher rate of co-occurring significant physical health conditions. Linford talked about managing his diabetes. There's a significantly higher rate of cardiovascular disease. And so if those conditions are co-occurring and unmanaged, ultimately it is one of the key drivers um, for the really disproportionate health care costs of people with these serious chronic conditions. And um, I'm not going to go into the details now, but there, there is a, um, actually a, a, a paper coming out relatively soon from our California Integration Project that really makes the case, the business case, for integration. And that's not just a financial case, it's also a quality of care case, but they're not, you can't disconnect them. So I don't know, San Mateo or Mary, you want to add anything to that comment? No, I think that's, I think you're right. I, I agree with everything you said. And so let me throw, we have time for, I think, one last question that I want to pose to the San Mateo folks. Um, you know, you've talked about some of your future steps in integrating um, care, and you've talked about the challenges that clients and consumers face in the, in, the, in the really different cultures across primary care, mental health, and substance use. 
do you have any plans regarding the use of peer specialists or promotorists or health coaches, navigators, um, to assist in that process as culture spanners? That's actually something that, that is being considered in different clinics around the state. And so I wondered if you have any, any plans that you're making. Um, I wanted, this is uh, Dr. Moreno again, um, you know, when we looked at our CalMEN project, we seriously considered that option. Uh, we actually moved away from it because of the time pressure, and we, did, we would have had to select a, a consumer, train, and so forth. But I think, I think it has a lot of validity. And just like we now have um, promotoras or navigators in our mental health clinics, I think some uh, training our consumers or developing consumers who have expertise uh, on, on the various, the medical, the AOD, and the, and the uh, mental health side of, of the house, and that can then navigate and assist consumers uh, to navigate our complex systems to help, for example, uh, many of our clients have a high no-show rate to their primary care appointments because they, their condition may impact their ability to, to track when their appointment is. They may not have the routine screenings like mammograms and PAPs, which is critical, again, in terms of health maintenance and um, could really make a difference. Yeah, and okay. I, I was, you know, I've thought for a while when, with the Mental Health Services Act and the larger, especially mental health, have um, a family support, uh, peer support, and I've wanted uh, that for the interface team also because I can see ways that that could be really helpful um, with helping the consumers that we treat and really even doing, even doing more prevention uh, with people maybe we don't treat, maybe we just do some group orientation, that kind of work with. And the problem has been, uh, the problem has really been space as to where to put them. Um, but I think that is really one of the next things that we want to do here. Well, and, and thank you for that comment. And yes, um, one of the, the key areas, one of the key challenges that, that um, we've heard around the state are simply, you know, having room to, to integrate uh, multiple disciplines and multiple providers. Um, so there, there was a comment that uh, Stanislaus County does a great job of integrating services and uh, are looking at collaborating with private agencies as well as um, for-profits and county-run um, services. So that was just a comment. And um, I think what I'm going to need to do at this point is to um, end our, our seminar, let me, just, let me just give you a pitch for what we're coming up on for the next one. Um, so I, first of all, I want to thank all of you for attending this fifth webinar in our six-part six series. Um, I'd also like to thank our outstanding panelists and, and for those of you that had to navigate um, the uh, getting back on the phone and, and some of the technical difficulties, I really want to thank all of you who are attendees and panelists for hanging in with us on this. Um, this webinar was recorded and will be posted on the CIMH Integration Initiative webpage at the link that you will see on your screen. Um, that'll be our final slide, Darcy, if you want to move that. Um, our next webinar is on June 24th and will focus on paying for integrated services, FQHC, Medi-Cal, and other funding strategies. And um, Dale Jarvis uh, will be with us, and some of you are very aware of some of the groundbreaking work that uh, Dale Jarvis has been doing around healthcare reform and how we move into that um, more integrated world um, under healthcare reform. So to register for this webinar, you need to go to the link on your screen and um, register online. So again, I really want to thank all of you for participating with us today. And um, thank you, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. OK, Celia and panelists, why don't you stay on the line for a minute if you can?
We'll close out the rest of the participants, and we can have a couple of minutes to debrief. Yes. I'll start dismissing folks. Thanks, Gail. Thank you. So we'll just pause for a minute while the, the attendees are hanging up and dismissed, and we'll, we'll go from there. The numbers is going down. Oh. Yeah, down. can you see the numbers falling? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know how many people were on It was like 70-something. 70? Mm-hmm. 75, yeah. Okay, we'll just give it another couple minutes, and Darcy will have everyone signed off, and we can all debrief. <laughs> The, just so you know, the, the webinar that Dale Jarvis is doing is actually going to address the business case for integration and, you know, from a starting with the clinical perspective very briefly, but then I think it'll be very, very interesting in terms of what the options are. And Mary, I know that you just recently had a meeting with Barbara Maurer that, that uh, looked at that. Yeah, we, she present, we had a we had a roundtable with the CEOs of our grantee, the clinics that are receiving grants this round, and we, she presented the business case paper. Very interesting conversation. Right, right. I was aware of that. I just spent an hour this morning on the phone with Dale. Okay, we are... Is he going to present the paper as well then, basically? Well, I think he's going to be... Um, it won't just be the paper, because um, the, the you know we also... Part of the, the webinar focus is to get into some of the practicalities of kind of financing now as well. Um, but he's going to use some of the concepts in that paper. Okay. okay. Well, a big thank you to all of you. Uh, San Mateo folks, that must have been really um, <laughs> challenging and Mary and I were dancing as fast as we could. <laughs> I thought you did a great job. <laughs> you danced, you sang and danced beautifully, Gail and Mary. <laughs> well, Mary, thank goodness I had you on as a facilitator and you were there. Otherwise, I would have been doing a monologue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what actually happened? Do we know? We don't know because we, we just hung up and called in about four times and then all of a sudden, I don't know, it came back on. Yeah. So oh, weird. That's so oh. weird. Oh well. Well, well, there you go. well I, I just want you all to know that that this is the first entire webinar I've been responsible for, you know, in terms of going through the whole thing. I introduced the very first one. And so when this happened, I thought I have really reached my technical comeuppance in the world. Right. Well, it is <laughs> so, a good a a argument for having like a plan B just in case, actually. It, boy, it reinforces it for me, but I'm going to have to have questions plan B and monologue plan B for the future. Right. 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 It's so strange because we were communicating perfectly, and we didn't touch anything, and all of a sudden, we were off. Mm. So I don't know. So you're listening to Darcy. The only thing I know... Darcy, you need to get a little closer to your phone. It's oh. hard to hear you. I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me a little better? Yeah. yeah. Um, the only thing I noticed, and I didn't notice before it happened, but when it did happen, I noticed that on the audio portion that you guys were, it has the little microphone instead of the phone. So after everything, when you guys came back on, the phone icon was back. So I don't know if that little toggle somehow got switched, or even if you press tab or something, it might have, it might have just switched it from telephone to mic and speakers on the little audio um, menu, and then it switched back. But um, I did notice that, that all, those, all of a sudden the phone was back, so that was good. I noticed that the microphone was the one that was selected, and so we selected telephone here, but it didn't make any difference, and then we called in a couple more times, and then it finally, it finally worked. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, that technology is wonderful, but sometimes it goes bumps. So just, you know, my appreciation to all of you. And, and just, um, you know, just for a moment, are there any, um, any kind of thoughts you would have going forward? Or, um, you know, one of the areas, what we are hoping to do 